I was born in September 1924. Our home was in a small village on the Austrian side of the Bavarian Alps near Salzburg. On leaving school, I was apprenticed to my father, a master carpenter who ran a small workshop with a couple of employees. Notices of eligibility for conscription into the German Wehrmacht were distributed to our village in the autumn of 1942. It was a red-letter day for everybody. We twelve heroes turned out in our Sunday best. The fire brigade band played a rousing serenade. The Burgermeister delivered a stirring speech mentioning the fatherland and its struggle against world Bolshevism. Afterwards, girls of the Bund Deutsche Mädchen, or BDM, the girls' Hitler youth, gave each of us a large posy to be worn in the hatband of our Tyrolean headgear, or, if we were hatless, draped over the lapel and left shoulder of our jackets. Then we sat for a group photograph. None of us gave a thought to the possibility of our young lives being cut short in battle. When the war ended, only six of our group were still alive. I was able to complete my joinery apprenticeship before my formal conscription into Gebergsjäger Regiment 144, GJR of 3rd Gebergs Division, GD in February 1943. The division recruited principally from the Bavarian Alps region. At Kufstein I passed a sham medical to be declared Kriegsverwendungsfähig, fit for the front, and after the usual entry formalities, received my uniform issue and reported ten days later to the infantry depot at Mittenwald, west of Berchtesgaden. When I completed training six months later, I was a qualified SMG gunner. Never once throughout the basic course did I ever hear the term sniper as a tactical component in infantry warfare, as waged either by ourselves or the Soviets, although mention was made of male and female Russian sharpshooters who tended to fire upon us from positions rearward of the front line and who were the primary target for machine gunners. The training was hard, and the discipline, though lacking the chicanery which had characterised it pre-war, allowed no time for innocent loafing. The new recruit had to be brought to the peak of physical fitness and weapons handling. Instructors with front experience were at pains to pass on their practical knowledge. They knew the risks for the newcomer to the front. At the beginning of September 1943, I received my marching orders to join GJR 144 in the southern sector of the Eastern Front near Voroshilovsk, a town in the Ukraine, a few hundred kilometres north of the eastern end of the Sea of Azov. For the majority, there was a last opportunity to take leave of their families with a three-day leave pass. My mother stroked her hand tenderly over my head. My father, a soldier in the Great War, hid his concern behind a stiff upper lip and great industry in his carpentry workshop. When I was about to board the bus for Mittenwald Barracks, my mother burst into tears and my father hugged me, something he had never done before. Clearly restraining his emotions, he whispered, Take care, my boy. I wish from the bottom of my heart that you come home safely, but everything lies in God's hands. As the bus drove away from the village, I waved back once and then stared ahead, otherwise for sure I would have cried myself. Within days we were trundling across the endless Russian steppe for the Donitz Basin. Each cattle truck had a deep litter of straw and was part of a long train pulled by two locomotives and protected against enemy aircraft and partisans by 20 MR flak quadruples in cupolas on two freight chassis. It was July in Russia and baking hot. The loss of 250,000 men with all their armament and equipment at Stalingrad at the beginning of 1943 had marked the turn of the tide for the Wehrmacht. On two consecutive evenings, 18th and 19th December 1942, Field Marshal von Manstein had requested that Hitler allow the Sixth Army to break out of the encirclement at Stalingrad, this being the only way to save the mass of the men. In this he had the vociferous support of Kurt Seitzler, chief of the general staff. But Hitler turned down the suggestion. To retreat a step anywhere was against his military philosophy. The last hope was now Field Marshal Paulus, as the diary entry of Hitler's army adjutant, Major Gerhard Engel, for 22nd December 1942, makes clear, FHQ Wehrwolf, deepest depression here. 
nearly everybody hoping that Paulus would take the risk and attempt to break out contrary to his orders. He would at least save the men, if at enormous loss in materials. Yodel spoke very seriously this evening, and one could see that he was banking on this independent decision. But Paulus was no Manstein, nor even a Yodel, and the Sixth Army stayed at Stalingrad to rot. During the winter of 1942-1943, GJR 144 of 3rd GD fought south of Stalingrad and narrowly escaped becoming involved in the encirclement. After murderous winter fighting at Milerov and breaking out to join the new front at Voroshilovsk, the regiment had been reduced to a quarter of its authorised strength. The regiment dug in and was reconstituted with men and equipment over the next six months. During this rest it was fortunate to be confronted by little more than nuisance raids, from which the odd skirmish resulted, the occasional artillery barrage and Russian sniper fire. The latter claimed its victims, particularly among new arrivals and the inexperienced. Most of the time the Germans were helpless against the sniper phenomenon due to the shortage of heavy weapons. It was a relatively rare occurrence that a sniper was located and engaged with medium infantry weapons such as mortars, MGs or the rare pack anti-tank gun. The German side suffered from a total lack of snipers. I belonged to a group making up the last personnel replacements bringing GJR 144 to full strength. For three weeks, 3rd GD had been watching with alarm as the Red Army, strengthened by supplies of new American weapons, was equipping for a new offensive in the Donetsk Basin and the Ukraine, and so every new recruit arriving at Voroshilovsk was extremely welcome. Upon our arrival, we had the fortune to experience our baptism of fire immediately. Without having an opportunity to acclimatise, we were pitched into the extremely bitter and bloody fighting in the Red Kina Gap a day after arriving. We had been dealt a bum hand from the bottom of the pack, and for the remainder of the war, 3rd GD was used purely as infantry, always present at the hot spots of the fighting in the southern section of the Eastern Front. Our losses were enormous, and in the final reckoning, exceeded by several times the authorised personnel strength. The Donets Basin, with its extensive coal mines, was an important supplier of raw material. This ensured it was a focus of great interest to the opposing belligerents. The mines, with their huge gallery systems, had not been investigated and mopped up during the German advance. Whole Soviet battle groups lurked underground, allowing Wehrmacht units to pass overhead. Wherever they were in a position to do so, these Russian forces would appear suddenly as if from nowhere to attack the German line from behind. Such encounters developed into fearsome hand-to-hand -hand engagements which often spilt back down into the galleries. With great energy the Soviets had already breached the German line and were now attempting to widen the bridgehead. The 3rd GD commander considered the situation to be so dangerous that he launched an immediate counter-attack without prior preparation or the regrouping of his forces. This succeeded, but amounted to a Pyrrhic victory. At first light, on 18th July 1943, we Jaeger too moved stealthily towards our forward trenches, tension and nervousness etched into hard facial features. Each man had his own method of overcoming his anxiety before each fresh engagement, chewing on a lump of black bread, smoking, urinating or evacuating frequently, while most of the new arrivals seemed to have a motor disorder and jerked from place to place. I watched it all with acute discomfort. My own condition was not good. My stomach rebelled at the thought of food and my limbs felt like jelly. In such a critical situation, I realised what a godsend it was to have a veteran platoon commander long since baptised with the waters of the front. Noticing my fear, he spoke to me in soothing tones. Just keep taking deep breaths, Junger. Keep your mind on your MG and shoot just like you have been trained. Watch for my signals. I look after my boys, and I will be there with you in the thick of it. So far, I have brought my platoon out of every chamozzle, and I haven't lost a man yet. His words, the truth of the latter sentence highly dubious, gave me strength to overcome my ancetes and stand firm in the face of whatever horrors my baptism of fire was to bring. The first stage of our attack began at just before five with an artillery barrage. 
The idea seemed to be to pluch the terrain in front of us in progressive stages. The earth was turned over with a succession of dull thuds, the explosion from each shell spraying large clumps of sod into the clear morning sky. As each salvo lengthened, I became aware of strange, sickening screams amidst the roars of shells impacting and the whizzing sigh of metal splinters. We German Jaeger cowered in our trenches and awaited the order to advance. After about twenty minutes, the artillery barrage fell away and an ominous silence fell, through which the terrible cries of the Russian wounded were clearly audible. The order came to attack. Suddenly all my nervousness disappeared. The battle sucked us forward across the broken earth like a whirlwind. The Russian artillery opened fire. As I rose up from my trench, the first shells began to explode in our ranks. I heard a whizzing, ripping noise nearby. My comrade immediately to the right, an eighteen-year-old from Berchtesgaden, had been hit. A splinter had ripped open his tunic and abdomen, allowing his intestines to pour free. After a second or so of disbelief, he attempted to restore the steaming organs. I laid down my MG, thinking it my duty to help him. The NCO, non-commissioned officer, clapped my shoulder and shouted, Forward attack! There's nothing more you can do for your friend. Give the men covering fire. The wounded youth had sunk to his knees, from where he fell face first in the churned earth. I retrieved the MG and scrambled forward, my mind empty of thought. The primeval instinct for survival had taken possession of me. Death, fear, anxiety had lost their meaning. Shoot, reload, move forward was the only reality. Seek cover, search for the enemy like an animal of prey. Within me a strange metamorphosis was taking place. The lowbrow who had risen from the trench would, during the next few hours of violent battle, become an infantryman, better still a warrior in the original sense of the word. Fear, blood, death were the ingredients in an alchemy that intoxicated and drugged its participant. It marked the end of my personal innocence and swept away all visions and dreams of my future, swept away my life. I was being forced to kill. Killing on the battlefield was to be my trade. Fate required of me that I should perfect it to mastery. For a brief while we moved forward unmolested by enemy fire. Protected by the MGs on its flanks, our group crept warily through the bushy terrain. When firing commenced from a concealed position in the undergrowth about twenty metres away, a Yaga fell without a sound in the stream of bullets from a machine pistol. I returned MG fire without hesitation while the men threw themselves down. Once a salvo of stick grenades had silenced the Russian fire, the Jäger snaked forward to the enemy hide, which was by now abandoned. Beyond the bushes lay the bodies of four dead Russians who had fallen just short of the entrance to the artfully concealed underground gallery. It had probably been their home for months. Fresh tracks led into the shaft. A mixture of curiosity and fascination drove the Yaga patrol, rifles cocked ever deeper into the abysmal darkness. A few minutes after the ground had swallowed them, I heard the dull sound of shooting from within, and a brief while later the patrol tumbled out into the daylight, all of them white as a sheet, some retching, all visibly horrified. There was no time for questions, for just then a Russian company launched a fresh attack, and the whirlwind of the firefight tore us away with it. The bitter struggle continued until dusk fell at about ten, when our platoon retired to the forward trenches from where we had embarked upon our advance early that morning. The extent of the Russian resistance had been underestimated, and we would have to repeat the whole procedure tomorrow. Both sides reorganised overnight, allowing each other a few hours' rest. The pause was also used to distribute ammunitions and rations, and bandage the walking wounded still able to fight. I considered it a minor miracle that I had spent the day without incurring a scratch, in contrast to many of my comrades. Squatting with a chunk of bread, a tin of sardines and a cigarette, we reviewed the events of the day in brief snatches of conversation. I asked about the occurrence in the underground gallery. In pithy sentences filled with undisguised disgust and horror, the two surviving Jaeger told their story. It involved an event, 
irrational and incomprehensible, such as often occurs in war, which gave us an insight into the type of enemy, the type of human beings, if you could call them such, that the political commissars were. Gingerly feeling their way forward through the gloom, our patrol had progressed about fifty metres when they came to an ill-lit alcove around which wafted a bestial stink. They waited for their eyes to accustom to the darkness and then took it all in. In one corner cowered two Russian soldiers, youths who appeared to be about sixteen, huddled together for safety. In another corner were a number of ammunition boxes arranged to make a table which bore the remains of a dismembered human body. The cadaver had apparently been smoked over a fire for preservation and later use as rations. A third corner had been set aside for the usual ablutions and general waste, which now included putrefying body parts, bones and human organs rejected for consumption. Curious, a Jaeger asked the two trembling Russian survivors for an explanation. He was assisted by a Jaeger interpreter who happened to speak some Russian. The two young Russians stated that during the Soviet retreat in August the previous year, when German panzers, rolling forward towards Maikop and the Russian oil fields, had overrun Voroshilovsk, 35 Russian soldiers had been left behind with strict instructions to occupy this gallery unnoticed for as long as possible, or until the Russian counter-offensive succeeded. As the months passed by, the supplies became exhausted. The group leader, a political commissar, had been charged with the strictest enforcement of the orders. When finally the men had mustered the courage to protest and demand a withdrawal from the gallery, the commissar had simply put down the little revolt by drawing his pistol and shooting two protesters in the head. Brandishing the weapon towards the survivors, he had ordered them to eviscerate the bodies and smoke the flesh over a fire. The livers, being edible fresh, were to be removed and divided into equal portions for immediate consumption. Over the next few weeks, the smoked human flesh had supplemented their rations. The political officer had the support of his sergeant and two NCOs, who kept the weapons under lock and key. Once the requirement arose for more meat, the commissar selected another victim and shot him. It was these remains which the German patrol had found on the makeshift table. A few days later, the Russian counter-offensive began, and as it swept over the gallery, the group had emerged at last to engage German forces. In the lugubrious gloom with its unspeakable odour, a Jaeger vomited. Upon finishing, he released the safety catch of his MP40 as he stood up, said simply, You filthy scum, and emptied the contents of the magazine into the two Russians. The platoon NCO ordered everybody out, and they stumbled at the double through the apocalyptic tunnel to breathe the fresh, sweet air above ground. For the veterans, this was merely an episode, but it provided me with an insight into the abyss of the human state in war. It was an indication of how the Soviet political system, through its commissars, was prepared to sacrifice all vestiges of human decency in the treatment, even of its own, in the quest for victory. There had been rumours that an order had been issued from the highest level to the effect that these political commissars were not to be afforded the status of prisoners of war if captured, and perhaps there was some obscure justification for that alleged directive being given. Yet even so, that vile gallery had been a gentle, and for us, harmless initiation into what was to follow. There was no time for deeper reflection. The important things were food and sleep, and precious little time remained before daylight came. Supported by artillery and self-propelled guns, it took us another four days to wear down the Russian resistance. We retook the high ground at Voroshilovsk, but it cost us the lives of 655 German soldiers to do so. By the end of these five days, I had lost what remained of my youthful innocence. The experience of the fighting to regain Voroshilovsk left its mark on my now pinched features. To judge by my reflection in the mirror, I had aged ten years. At the outset, my platoon had consisted of twenty men, of whom the NCO and myself were the only survivors. I had lost the feeling for time, anxiety, fear, compassion. I was a living football of events, propelled by the boot of an archaic survival instinct fuelled by the interchange of fighting, hunger, thirst and exhaustion. 
On 22nd July 1943, we re-established the German front line. The Russians fought with a courage born of desperation. Well camouflaged, they often displayed tremendous discipline in the field, refusing combat until within 50 metres, at which distance the survivors inflicted significant casualties in our ranks, and their snipers in particular wrought havoc among the Jaeger. For myself, I was uncomfortably aware that the SMG gunner at the front was on a suicide mission. The tactical importance of MGs meant that they were pinpointed as priority targets in battle and received the attentions of heavy infantry weapons such as mortars and infantry guns, not to mention snipers. The losses in machine gunners were therefore disproportionately high. The first few days at the front had made it obvious to me that my chances of surviving to my 19th birthday were rather slim and depended largely upon whether I could exchange my work as a machine gunner for another line of business at the earliest opportunity. That same day I received a splinter wound to the left hand. One accepts such things with cool fatalism as an occupational hazard of war. To my surprise it gave me no pain and hardly bled. After testing the flexibility of my hand a few times, I withdrew behind my MG to apply a field dressing. My number two helped me to quickly wind the thick gauze over the gaping wound. As soon as we had finished, he yelled a warning, Sep, ahead, they're coming! Shoot! Shoot! The pain did not set in until several hours later, by which time my platoon had been pulled out of the line and could enjoy a little peace. The field hospital assembly point was near the field kitchen. A surgeon, accompanied by several assistants, waited to make a preliminary inspection of reported wounds. I was directed towards a small thatched farm cottage, set a short distance from the regimental headquarter. Entering the field dressing station, a large marquee, I registered without emotion the groaning, whimpering, a few cries of pain and the smell of raw flesh. One of the medical corps NCOs sorted the arriving wounded according to the severity of the wound. A very young soldier was carried in on a stretcher, his now paraplegic body wobbling below a boyish face, from which issued repeatedly the words, I can't move anything, oh God, I can't move anything. The medic sergeant raised the upper body, which was uninjured to the front. Between the shoulder blades gaped a wound of two hands' width, through which some splintered backbone and rib segments were visible. Carefully laying the patient to rest, he said, He is beyond help, Junger. With these injuries, death will come as a blessing. Take him to the clergyman in the barn over there. The barn was where the hopeless cases were brought to receive, from a visibly overcome Wehrmacht Catholic priest, the last rites and spiritual help in their final moments. My own injury was classified as minor, and I had to queue to be attended to. There was little privacy. A sergeant was seated nearby, his right arm bound in a handkerchief and stick tourniquet. The hand was attached to the forearm by a few tendons. He was clearly in shock. Whether this was considered a minor injury, I had no means of knowing. My turn arrived after three hours. The duty of the medic sergeant was to cleanse and stitch flesh wounds. Without speaking, he removed my dressing, examined the wound for possible foreign bodies, and cleansed it with a sulfonamide solution. A very muscular medic private then seized the arm in a judo hold and turned me to obstruct my view of the wound. Immediately, and without any anaesthetic, deftly and with great skill, the sergeant began cutting the wound. Edges clean before stitching. Still holding my arm in an iron grip, the private advised me, Cry out quietly, it will help. All my tensions and self-control now fell away, and I became fully aware of the pain. As I cried, I gave vent to my fury at all the inhuman experiences I had endured over the last five days. The wound required fourteen days' convalescence. I was sent to regimental reserve, where I could perform light duties during the healing process. GJR 144 had suffered heavy casualties and was in the rear at Voroshilovsk for replenishment in personnel and material. As an apprenticed carpenter, I was assigned to the regimental arsenal and given the job of sorting through a mountain of captured Russian weapons. In the second week of my convalescence, I worked at repairing the stocks of damaged German carbines. In the relative quiet and safety of the rear area, 
I determined to accept the first chance that offered itself to avoid being returned to the front as an MG gunner. Who knows what quirk of fate operated that I should discover in that great heap of Russian weapons, a sniper's rifle which had been captured by my company, and, overlooked, had not been sent on to the rear collection centre. It was a Mosin Nagant 9-1 third-tire model. At once I petitioned the chief armourer for permission to practice with the weapon. There was Russian ammunition available in plenty, and the far-sighted warrant officer said, Show what you can do. Perhaps you're a born sharpshooter. We can use men like that to keep Ivan on his toes. You know yourself how their snipers make our lives a misery. I grasped the opportunity gratefully, and that same evening began to practice. After a few days, I found that my aim was unerring. Apparently without effort I could hit a matchbox at 100 metres, and the wooden lid of an ammunition box with sides 30 centimetres long at 300 metres. The chief armourer confessed himself impressed. My wound was healing well, and all too soon my fourteen days' convalescence came to an end. With orders to return to my company, I reported to the chief armourer to take my leave of him. Handing me a PU magnification telescopic sight of Russian manufacture, he said, Sep, I have spoken to your company commander and told him about your shooting ability. He has no objection to your testing your luck as a sniper. So, Junger, show Ivan what you can do. In the first days of August 1943, I rejoined my company, my Russian sniper's rifle under my arm. When I reported to the company commander, he presented me with the wound badge in black and a citation saying, Alla Berger, don't think it's all behind you now. That was just a foretaste. Whatever else you do, remember to keep your ass down, particularly as a sniper. Now fall out and get Ivan annoyed. The front was relatively quiet, activity being limited to the occasional minor artillery duel and skirmishes with reconnaissance patrols, although the pressure from Russian snipers was enormous. It was very dangerous to expose oneself momentarily, and despite the greatest precautions, they regularly found a new victim. My company commander was a very open personality, convinced of the advantage of having his own team of snipers and who complained bitterly at the lack of them. His was not a generally held opinion. Many officers considered the sniper to be no better than a blackguard and his craft a dishonourable and perfidious form of warfare, and thus refused to have any. An officer of 3rd GD set out his objections in his memoirs thus. Was he perhaps one of those marksmen who at daybreak or dusk slunk out and lay still, his gaze like that of a cat observing a mouse hole waiting for a shoulder, a head to appear just for a second but long enough? A shot cracked the stillness. From a hand slowly losing its grasp there fell an empty fruit tin, the basic need which cost a man his life. Is that warfare? In the Second World War, a major problem for soldiers on active duty living rough in a confined space such as trenches was the disposal of solid excrement. It was frequently not possible to dig some form of latrine trench, and so the practice of infantrymen was to have a personal camping loo, usually a large tin, which would then be emptied over the trench parapet. This action tended to expose some part of the body, and an enemy sniper would have no hesitation in accepting the opportunity to fire a bullet into it. The lines written by the 3rd GD officer do not reflect reality. When night fell over the respective trenches, it did not bring with it a truce. Patrols tended to wander abroad at night into no man's land. The capture or killing of an enemy sentry, or the lobbing of a few grenades into the opposing trenches during such a mission had never been considered unethical in the earlier Great War. War is neither ethical nor heroic. Its purpose is to obtain a political objective by the use of maximum force in the field, and it is ultimately irrelevant to any victim whether he fell to a sniper's bullet or was ripped apart by a hand grenade. Once satisfied that the sniper was not outlawed by international convention, it was the third GD officer's duty to ensure that proper precautions were in place to protect their own, and then respond in kind. This raised certain ethical questions which I will tackle later. Whereas the use of the tactics described may well have been considered perfidious, 
Any objection to freelance marksmen skilled in fieldcraft using their abilities to the advantage of their own side at the front seems ridiculous. I had managed to shed my suicide job as an SMG gunner. I was now directly responsible to the company commander, and as the situation at the time was one of defending the trenches, I was given free rein to fire at whatever target I thought fit. By instinct, I did the right thing, and on the first day went from trench to trench interviewing colleagues on their impressions of enemy activity, and in particular about anything observed in the adjacent 300 metres of no man's land. Everywhere I was met with a sigh of relief. At long last, a sniper! Show them, Sep! An MG platoon commander took me by the sleeve and led me to a sap. For protection, the forward edge of each trench had a parapet of logs. Through a small chink between two sturdy logs, he indicated the lie of the Russian trenches and told me, In no man's land, ahead of their lines, there is a sniper. He has been there several days. He shoots at absolutely everything. Look, he even hold the cooking pot we raised above the parapet. Think you can get him off our backs? A sniper emerges. Using the magnification telescope with which the company commander had issued me, I surveyed the terrain extending from our trenches through the small gap between the parapet logs, but could make out nothing suspicious. Cautiously, I raised a rolled-up field tent, topped by a peaked field cap, above the logs while I observed the Russian positions. Their sniper was probably inexperienced in the art, for he fired as soon as the field cap appeared. I saw the flash of fire from his carbine and the merest trace of smoke, and also detected the slight shimmer on the lens of his telescopic sight. Now I knew his position. In this first engagement, I had already shown my intuitive feel for the sniper's role. I made a mental note of the first rule of sniper combat. Never fire at anything not positively identified. When allowed to fire at will, loose off only one shot from a lair, then either change location or at least desist temporarily from further activity and conceal yourself. My opponent remained where he was, awaiting a fresh opportunity, a fatal error for which he was to pay with his life. I placed the rolled tent on the parapet ledge as a rest for the forestock and cautiously poked the muzzle of my carbine through the observation gap between the logs. I could not use the telescopic sight because the crack was too narrow, the Russian was about 90 metres away, within effective range for the weapon's fixed sights. I felt very nervous. The Jaeger were expecting a super-precise shot, and I was now confronted with the task, for the first time in my life, of deliberately aiming to kill a man in cold blood. Was this scrupulous? My throat was dry, my heart raced, and while aiming the weapon I noticed how it trembled in my hands. I could not fire the shot in this condition and held back, taking several deep breaths to compose myself. Colleagues surrounded me, watching with expectation. What could be worse? I settled the weapon into my shoulder once more, aimed carefully and hesitated. What are you waiting for? Let him have it, somebody said from several yards away. This evaporated my tension. In a dream and with machine-like precision, I began to curl my trigger finger. Taking up the pressure I breathed in, held my breath and squeezed. The rifle cracked, a thick wisp of smoke drifted across the field of fire, obscuring my vision. A Jaeger watching through another slit in the parapet logs shouted, You got him, man, right between the eyes. He's dead. The news of the death of the Russian sniper spread like a forest fire through the trenches. Suddenly MGs began to bark, carbines cracked and somebody yelled, Attack! The Russians, completely surprised by our activity and the sudden assault by German troops, fled their advanced trenches for their main front line. We reached the abandoned positions without encountering resistance. In curiosity, a group of us made a short detour for the hide from where the Russian sniper had been operating, a scattered pile of logs beneath which he had dug a hollow, now a shallow, open grave for his body. Beside his feet was a trail of blood. Two Jaeger dragged the body free by the ankles. The Russian was a boy of about sixteen with crew-cut hair. The bullet had entered through his right eye. A bloody mash of brain and bone splinters covered his upper torso at the back. 
The fist-sized exit wound in his head revealed that his skull had been cleaned of cerebral matter by the pressure wave of the rifle bullet. You hit him cleanly with a single shot, dear boy, and over open sights at almost a hundred metres. You're good, Sep, a Jaeger commented. I stared at my victim with a mixture of pride, revulsion and bad conscience. All at once my stomach revolted and I vomited up my most recent meal of black bread, sardines in oil and malt coffee. My colleagues reacted with sympathy and understanding for my lack of control. A blue-eyed NCO, ten years my senior in years, head and shoulders above me in height and wearing a large reddish beard, comforted me with a striking North German accent. No need to be ashamed, old man. It has happened to the best of us. You just have to get over it. Better to sick up than shit your pants. As it happens, Papa has a remedy, and at that he withdrew a silvery schnapps flask from a breast pocket and offered me a slug. I took a mouthful and handed it back, thinking as I did so. He looks like a Viking. The only things missing are the horns on his helmet. The idea of a Viking serving with the mountain troops amused me and made me smile. By now the Soviets had gathered their wits and had begun a counter-attack. An hour later we were all back in the positions we had occupied earlier. I had passed the sniper's practical and was now accepted in the role by all and sundry. The admiration this engendered enabled me to shrug off the feelings of revulsion I still felt for my deed. I made a mental note of the second rule of sniper fieldcraft, War is a merciless system of killing and being killed. In action, sympathy for the enemy is ultimately suicide, for every opponent whom you do not kill can turn the tables and kill you. Your chances of survival are measured by the yardstick of how you compare in skill and objectivity as against your opponent. This was a principle to which I remained true throughout. If I had an enemy in the crosswires of my telescopic sight and a finger on the trigger, his fate was sealed. That same day I killed two other careless Russians. In youthful pride at my success, I used my pocket knife to make three notches in the stock of my rifle, a ritual I kept up while I had my Russian sniper rifle, and not until the death of a fellow sniper in action a year later did I abandon this suicidal habit. The same day, the Spes Company Sergeant Major or CSM told me that every kill claimed required a witness in the shape of an officer or NCO with the company command. Those kills outside offensive and defensive manoeuvres in the fighting for trench positions would not count. I had to keep a small pocketbook listing my kills, and these also had to be confirmed by an officer or NCO. For every ten confirmed kills, I would receive a seven centimetre long and one centimetre wide strip of silver trim, such as NCOs wore along the edge of the jacket collar, and these were to be sewn on the lower left sleeve. Yet the obtaining of confirmation was often a difficult business. Many NCOs envied a sniper his success and refused to sign. Artillery spotters, especially young officers full of military idealism, considered Wehrmacht snipers as loathsome assassins and used the opportunity to express their undisguised antipathy by declining their signature. This was also the reason why few artillery spotters and snipers ever cooperated. Another reason for the institutional antipathy was the practice of snipers to dress up dummies in the garb of artillery spotters to lure enemy snipers' fire. We had the unofficial acquisition of tents and items from officers' uniforms off to a fine art. Over the ensuing 14 days, I scored another 27 kills. My new career was rapidly becoming routine, although as a greenhorn I had a certain amount of luck. My Russian counterparts had classified me as competent and tended to avoid my field of fire, and so our company's sector of the front remained relatively quiet. This gave me the opportunity to learn from my mistakes in the field, an advantage denied many other newcomers lacking battle experience who had been required to pay with their lives for a minor oversight. On or about 18th August 1943, the long days of waiting came to an abrupt end. Days previous, the Soviets had stepped up their artillery bombardment, culminating in a major offensive the entire length of the Donets front. Impressively superior in numbers, they had soon penetrated the main German front line. We abandoned our positions and, on the defensive, 
I was able to demonstrate how a good sniper could be of outstanding tactical significance. Although I had been at the front less than two months, I had the stoical calm and cold-bloodedness of the veteran infantryman. Even in very dangerous situations, I found I could keep my nerve and fight as if inspired. I was endowed with the skill of the warrior, something which theory cannot pass down and which even the best training school is unable to inculcate. Battle proves the soldier in the mastery of personal fear and the natural impulse to turn and run. On 27th August 1943, Hitler returned to his former FHQ Wehrwolf in Woodland, north of Vinitsa, where he met General Field Marshal von Manstein, commanding General Army Group South. The message was not a pleasant one for Hitler's ears. If Manstein could not be guaranteed another 12 divisions immediately, he would have to evacuate the Donetsk Basin. Since these did not exist, Hitler gave his tacit permission in promising him all units which can be made available. He then returned to FHQ Wolfschanzer in East Prussia, 3rd GD began a systematic and orderly retreat to the Dnieper about 200 kilometres to the southwest. Matching 33 divisions against the 10 of the German side, bled of personnel and weapons, the Russians headed this vastly superior force towards the German lines where every kilometre was defended by no more than 90 infantrymen. To close the gaps, logistical and other rearward units were thrown forward. We had no reserves nor strength in depth. If the Soviets breached the front, the effect would be immediate and calamitous. 3rd GD was at the heart of the heaviest fighting, at Saporishi, where two separate Soviet columns were attempting to break through on the flanks in a pincer movement. Although GJR 144 was faced by an enemy ten times stronger at the strategically important locations, the line of resistance held and afforded other units the opportunity to fall back and regroup. Frequently shifting strong points, the Russian offensive ground on for weeks until at last, in September, the unpaved main highways and roads were transformed into a knee-deep, impassable morass by the early onset of the incessant rains of autumn. Chronic lack of sleep, problems of bringing up munitions and food, and the pressure to fight, fight and keep fighting, made unceasing demands on our last physical reserves. It characterised our daily situation and remained the standard for the remainder of the war. My company was ordered to cover the regiment's withdrawal. Sixty Jaeger occupied a village at a strategically important crossroads in order to hold back the Russian motorised advance. Enemy reconnaissance quickly established the pitifully small strength of the unit. The Soviets encircled us and stood poised to wipe us out. Our company was a veteran and well-disciplined fighting force. Well, dug in and with accurate defensive fire, we kept the Russians at a distance. Even tank and anti-tank rounds presented us with few problems in our foxholes. It was in battles such as this one that the sniper's hour arrived. At ranges up to 300 metres, shot after shot found its billet. At the focal point of all our battles, I made my appearance and forced the enemy on the defensive by my almost infallible shooting. My nerves were of steel. I knew this for sure as each projectile found its way with deadly certainty into the Russian ranks. In these desperate encounters, it gave us a decisive edge if one could undermine the enemy's fighting spirit. The experienced sniper therefore aimed less for fatal hits than for hits to the torso, which put a man out of action and left him screaming in agony. The scheme of a Russian attack was to send forward their troops in waves. The first two waves would usually be armed, the rear two waves often weaponless. As the first two waves were cut down, the rear attackers advanced over the corpses of their comrades, availing themselves of the weapons no longer needed by the dead. This was an interesting strategy that must have had an unenviable effect on their troops' morale. After some thought, I developed my own response to perfection. I would bide my time until the four waves were on their way towards our lines, then open rapid fire into the two rear waves, aiming for the stomach. The unexpected casualties at the rear and the terrible cries of the most seriously wounded tended to collapse the rear lines and so disconcert the two leading ranks that the whole attack would begin to falter. At this point I could now concentrate on the two leading waves, dispatching those Soviets closer than 50 metres, 
with a shot to the heart or the head. Enemy soldiers who had turned and run I transformed into men screaming with pain with a shot to the kidneys. At this, an attack would frequently disintegrate altogether. In such an engagement I would often fire off more than twenty rounds, none of which counted towards my final total of kills. In this manner, over two days, in cooperation with comrades, I played my part in saving our company. On the second night the company escaped the encirclement, taking with it thirteen wounded. I held the rear, keeping the pursuers at a respectful distance with accurate sniper fire, until, at first light, we re-established contact with our main front line. The question of ethics and honour involved in my tactics is open to question, but against such an enemy as the Soviets, who had no hesitation in slaughtering the prisoners they took and outnumbered us ten to one, I considered it justified in the circumstances. Reaching the precarious safety of our battle line did not mean that we could have a good rest. At daylight the Russians attacked anew, although they seemed cautious. They had a new ruse, sending forward three T-34s supported by infantry, and from cover we listened to the monsters trundling in our direction. I had dug a hollow along our defensive line of improvised positions, which the infantry had done their best to camouflage. At about 100 metres from our trenches, the leading T-34 jolted to a sudden stop. The turret rotated with an audible hum and the gun swept the terrain as if sniffing for us. When the turret stopped, the hatch opened a few seconds later. I aimed the cross wires of my telescopic sight at the lid. A head protruded two hands' breadth above the rim, and a pair of hands raised binoculars to the head's eyes. I had calibrated my weapon on a pinpoint at 120 metres. If he raised himself much higher, I would be bound to score. In this situation it was absolutely essential that the shot was good, for it would signal the firefight to begin. I hesitated briefly, during which time it occurred to me that this individual was probably not only the commander of the tank, but possibly of the entire attack. His death might decide the affair in our favour. I took a deep breath, concentrated, put myself into a calm frame of mind, drew back the trigger evenly, and the shot cracked out. Through the sight I saw a torrent of blood spatter the hatch lid, after which the heat disappeared. Seconds later everybody big and fearing. The three tanks, immobile, rained a harmless fire above our lines. After a few minutes their motors started up and the colossi reversed, confirming my assumption. The Soviet attack was now leaderless, and when the Soviet follow-up began an hour later it lacked impetus and conviction. A single bullet had rendered the enemy assault literally headless and, in all probability, enabled us to ward it off. The offensive petered out on 20 September, by which time the German front had been shortened, consolidated, and the enemy breakthrough prevented thanks to the fighting spirit of 3rd GD. In the bitter fighting, our company, 144, lost more than half its complement. The survivors were exhausted and lice-infested, the majority either wounded or sick. The superhuman struggle they had waged for insignificant, nameless areas on a map was etched into their faces. Personally, I had come through unscathed, except for the lice, and diarrhoea occasioned by a recent staple diet of salted gherkins found in an outhouse on a Russian farm. During the lull, the division erected the Wotan Line. This temporary front induced in us a nostalgia for home, being a territory once inhabited by Volga Germans long since deported by the Soviets. The small, neat towns and villages had names like Heidelberg, Tiefenbrunn and Rosenberg. The houses had been abandoned but left in such good order, with cooking utensils hanging neatly in cupboards, that it looked for all the world like the former occupants would return at any moment. We dug in, mindful that within a few days or weeks the hurricane of destruction would sweep over it all. It was here that we experienced the first ugly premonitions of what was to befall our own nation, an omen of what lay ahead. While the Red Army regrouped for a new offensive, GJR 144 was near Gendelberg, its inadequate numbers swelling with convalescents and those returning from leave. The supply of weapons and ammunition to us was well below expectations. All the more essential had it therefore become to conduct a thorough reconnaissance of the terrain and identify the places where an enemy attack was likely to be focused, and accordingly where our own limited forces should best be located. 
It was of equal importance to deceive the enemy as to our meagre numbers by daring raids. Each early morning and at dusk I was to be found scouting ahead of our lines. It was my purpose to keep unwary Russian forward patrols away from our lines by surprise accurate fire, to decimate their numbers and drive the survivors back to their own trenches in disarray. The usual patrol they sent out had the single objective of spotting our positions, and in general they did not expect to run up against a lone sniper well out into no man's land. When they did, it tended to stun them momentarily, allowing me to rapidly shoot dead a number of the party, before they either gathered their wits sufficiently to find cover or withdrew to a safe distance. 